Well, Ramiz Atala attended an international conference for Christian leaders back in 1974. He was thrilled to be part of this convocation that really was the top leaders throughout the Bible-believing world everywhere. There was a lot of meaningful papers, a lot of important discussions, but he said the most important insight he learned was on his flight back to Canada. He writes, it was a long flight back home, and I had many papers to go through. I had taken business cards from all sorts of important global leaders that I had met. As I went through their cards, I noticed one was not very well printed, and I looked at it carefully. He said, I still get emotional as I think about this. He says, at the conference, we had small groups every night. About 10 of us would meet together in our dormitory to pray and to share what we had learned. The first night, we introduced ourselves, president of a seminary, pastor of a church of 2,000 people, and so on. Everyone was showing how great they were. I said, I led the InterVarsity movement in the province of Quebec. He says it actually is a very small ministry, but it sounded good. One African man with us said, I'm a pastor in Kenya. During the week, we all listened to each other. He said, I didn't pay much attention to the pastor from Kenya. I wanted to get close to the important people who were there. But I was moved by the pastor's stories of how God had touched him as a school teacher and changed his life. I thought he was a deep man and pictured him serving humbly in a small village in Africa. But when I picked up the business cards, I discovered that that one said, Festo Along, Archbishop of Kenya. He was a man who could have pulled rank on anybody in our group. He was a bigwig. But we didn't know it, and he didn't tell us. He did not use his position to secure his identity. He was a simple pastor who loved Jesus. Natala concludes, I'm still moved when I remember this incident 32 years later. And I said to myself on that plane, that's the kind of leader I want to be. That's leadership Jesus style. And today as we continue our passage in 1 Peter, we come to chapter 5 where Peter has a lot to say to leaders and those who would take positions of responsibility and about servant leadership. And so verse 1 says this, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Now the Greek word for elder here is presbuteros, the word presbyterian comes from it. These were not the older people in the church, these were the leaders. So elder was an official title, it did not have anything to do with age. So in other words, there were 80-year-old people who were not elders, and then there were 30-year-old people who would have been. Peter gives us another parallel term that he used earlier in, this, in the book of 1 uh, Peter, and that's overseer. And that Greek word is episcopale, which means to look after and care for, and I'm sure the Episcopalians got their name from this. This term seems to be interchangeable with the, both of these words, overseer or elder, are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Now, Peter is specifically here addressing elders, pastors, leaders, but these traits are really important for all leaders and workers in the church. Whether you're a care group leader or a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, a deaconess, vacation Bible school worker or a worship team member, outreach team, and anyone who serves. These are important traits that we should seek to have. So listen carefully because God may even be preparing you for a future role of leadership. Peter appeals to the elders as a fellow elder. In other words, hey, I'm one of you. What I'm saying to you is, is something I'm doing myself. And then he says in verse 2, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. <laughs> not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So as we read these verses, there's a lot of not this, instead you should do that, and we're going to begin by looking at the not this, the things leaders should not be doing. Peter writes, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Being a leader of the flock requires that a person be properly motivated. It says not because you must. The word here means to be constrained or forced. The idea is leaders should be muttering like, Great, I get to go serve those people again. That should never be the attitude. So our motivation is important because the task God has called leaders to is demanding. You cannot be a leader in God's church without giving up your rights, without being willing to serve and care for others. He continues by saying not pursuing dishonest gain. Now, the temptation to pad your pockets is always there, but certainly in that time it would have been easier. 
Um, often in ministry, the, the people would be giving to the poor. There was no welfare. Uh, there was no social security. So they would be giving gifts to those who need help and also to their church. And so an overseer would be in charge of that. And we know from the gospel accounts that Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was also the treasurer. Matter of fact, our treasurer, Dave Hill, um, sometimes if Dave's giving me a hard time, I'll just be like, what are you saying, Judas? <laughs> so that's just my nickname for him. And uh, the truth is, Dave is humble, he's godly, but call him Judas if you want, because Judas was the treasurer. <laughs> but the fact is, the Bible tells us Judas was actually taking money, he was stealing, taking money he wasn't supposed to be doing. Well, the apostle Paul said also that elders, pastors would be adequately paid, but he warns, as Peter does, of how we're to treat money right. Pierce is not pursuing dishonest gain. Now, in case you're wondering, I know my parents attended a church that had been around for about a decade. It was still kind of in a fairly new mode. So there were no records. No one had any idea how much was given. And the pastor's wife was in charge of all of the money. And they actually ended up leaving that church partly because of that issue, because there was no transparency of how much is given, how much are you guys making. At our church, we have salaries. Um, I do not touch the money, nor does Christian or Chris, our staff. None of us touch money as it comes in, nor can we write checks. If I call the bank, hey, I'm Mark and Kay from Grace Alliance Church, they'll say, yeah, who are you and why are you calling me? Because your name's not on our accounts. We're very careful about that because we want you to be able to trust that what's given is used as we say it will be used. Now, the phrase here, not pursuing dishonest gain, could be translated not greedy for shameful gain. So it's not just money that's being talked about. Uh, power can be misused. People can have the greed for power over others, for prestige. And I want to say this, if you're a leader in any of these or your motivation, repent and ask God to change your heart because we should want to serve out a desire to care for others and to love them. Look at verse 3, it says another not. Not lording it over those entrusted it to you. Now to lord over literally means domination. It's the exercise of complete control. And people who exercise complete control normally do it to satisfy their own needs and their own desires. They plot wondering, how can I benefit from this? So why is it there are some gifted people who sometimes aren't in leadership in a church setting? It's because their attitude is wrong. There are sometimes some powerful people who out in the real world are somewhat big and important, but if the motivation isn't right, then they should not be in leadership. Jesus exemplified it for us. It's all about serving others. It's about caring for people. So a domineering leader might get things done. They often do. I've known pastors, man, they just kick heads. You don't like my way? Out the door. That's kind of their attitude. And they often kind of get what they want, but what I've seen is a lot of broken, hurt people follow them. And so our goal as leaders, we are called to lead, but we're called to lead with humble, loving hearts. So when God looks for people to lead his church, it's clear egotism, self-centeredness, are absolutely the enemy of effective leadership. I have often said to our board members, and shared this in a, in a new year, that in the world, leadership is pretty much a triangle. If you're, an organ, if you're in an organization, at the top of that organization, that's the CEO, that's the president. They are important. What they say matters. Under them, you've got the VPs, the board, they are also important people. Not quite as important, but they are very important. Under them, you got middle management, lower management, and at the bottom, it's the workers. Is the person at the top really concerned about the life of an average worker? Yeah, normally not. Well, in the church, it's flipped upside down. The reality is here are those who just come sometimes on Sunday morning. They can really do whatever they want. They come, they don't come, they don't serve. They just kind of show up, and they've got a lot of latitude. Then there are those who have agreed, I'll serve, and now they're starting to narrow in because now they're saying, yeah, I'm going to give up my time. Right now there's some people in nursery. They'd probably rather be in here, but they're in there because they've agreed to serve. And then it continues to funnel down. Members agree. There's some commitments we ask of members about how they'll be committed to our church. Again, narrowing. And then the leaders, even more so, of the, I wonder what you say has an impact. How you treat people really says a lot about our church and about Christ. And so it's really important that for leaders to understand that we have to set the example. We're to be there for others. It's not just about what do we want. It's about what is Christ calling us to do. And so we need to sacrifice our preferences for the good of the kingdom. About 15 years ago, a few members of our board went to a seminar on outreach hosted by our district. 
One of the speakers talked about some of the things you need to do if you want to reach the younger generation, teens, 20s, 30s, and they kind of talked about music as one of the issues. And we came back and we spent some time really talking, what does this mean for our church? And one of the things we said is we're going to start to do more of the more modern songs. We're still going to always do hymns. We're going to do some of the classic Christian choruses, but we were going to start to be more, uh, really more focused on trying to add new songs in. And uh, I remember Rick Malwitz, who's one of our founding fathers, said something like this. He says, I don't necessarily like this new type of worship, but it's not about what I like. He said, Donna and I are not the future of the church. We need to reach those who are younger, and if this will help us do it, then that's great. And that's the attitude of a godly leader who says, this isn't my preference, but if this is what God's doing, then, then let's do it. So that not lording it uh, over others is what Peter says. That they're to want to serve. You know, again, a person might be wildly successful in what they do, whether it's business or writing books or whatever, but if they've not learned that people are the most important thing, mm -hmm. then they will never truly be leaders in God's church because Jesus put people above himself. So we've been talking about what godly servant leaders should not do. Well, what should they do? Well, we read in verse 2, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Now, the comparison to the shepherding of a flock is used throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter, we've seen other references to sheep. Jesus called Peter, if you remember, to feed his sheep. After Jesus has been resurrected, Peter had failed him horribly. What did Jesus say? Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And that's what leaders are called to do. Is he's passing on this responsibility. Christ called him to do it, and leaders are called to do that. In Scripture, sheep are the people, and the shepherds are the ones who are to care for them. Being a shepherd involves some rare characteristics, because the shepherd's whole life was committed to their sheep. Matter of fact, they would risk their life defending the sheep against predators. The sheep are the priority of the shepherd and not the shepherd himself. And so we shepherd as we oversee, as we lead with care. McKinney points out that word overseer has over the years picked up a kind of negative connotation. An overseer is the woman who looks over your shoulder at work to see if you're playing video games. The overseer is the guy in that upper room smoking a cigar and watching what everyone's doing. And that's not the kind of leader we're talking about. You know, on top is the tradition, the boss. You go and, you know, you're dragging the boss along. And underneath is what Christ is calling his people to do. And that's to be leaders who lead from the front, who say, man, here's where we're going. Here's what God's saying to do. Come with me. Not you go do the work. Not it's your responsibility. I was sharing with Christian yesterday. Um, our, we had a work day, and uh, I was there and helped, and uh, thank you to those who, who did help. And I said, you know, our church in Maryland, do you know how many times the pastor came to work day? And he said, no, how many? And I said, zero. He never once went. <clears throat> Now, here's the thing. He was a busy guy. He had a lot going on. There was nothing wrong with him not going. The truth is, my job is not to take care of, like, lawn, lawn care, landscaping, um, those kind of things. But the reality is, I feel it's really important as a pastor to show that, hey, I can do those things, too. Um, all of us are called. You know, it's not, I'm up here. I'm too good to do this. All of us are called to be servants and to be there. You know, Christ set the example. He was willing to wash the feet of his disciples, as I talked about last week. He did not demand, but instead he served others. He humbly was there for his people. I was on the board of trustees for the Nyack College and Alliance Theological Seminary. I graduated from the seminary. I was the representative for the Alumni Association. Now, on this board of trustees, our board of trustees takes care of the building. If you're familiar with colleges, trustees are the ones who make all the big decisions. And there are people who are pastors of churches of thousands. And there was a former baseball player. And there were some wealthy people, because the boards always want money. You get people with money, and they give a lot of money. So, so colleges get those people. And, and then just big wigs. And the, and the Christian Missionary Alliance, all of the vice presidents were there. And so people would be like, oh, what do you do? We're like, oh, I'm a pastor of 2,000. What do you do? I'm vice president of Christian Missionary Alliance. Mark, what do you do? Oh, I'm an associate pastor. Like, I was by and far the least important person there. Really, I mean, I was the bottom of the barrel. And what I really saw was leaders who just, it didn't matter. The vice presidents of the alliance, I always was like, I wonder what these people are like. They were humble. They were godly. They just treated me like I was, you know, there was no like, ooh, we're up here. And that's how leaders are to be. 
We're not better than you. And I think our church, if you know our leaders, we have people like that. People who humbly serve. And that's the reminder. We're called to do that. You know, 1 Peter earlier, again, as he talked about sheep, he said this in chapter 2. He said, for you who are like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The shepherd here is God. It's not referring to us. God is the one who shepherds us. He's the one who cares for us. He oversees us. How does he do it? Lovingly. And that's how leaders are to do it. Lovingly, as they care for those they serve. Well, how do they do that? What are some of the things? Like, what is an elder, overseer, leader to do? Well, they're to care for the sheep. Very famous psalm. Many of us know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God is our provider. He leads us to the place to eat, to the water to drink. And the same thing leaders' job is to serve those who are under them, those that God has placed under their care. A shepherding parent knows their, what their child needs, and they give it to them, whether it's a blanket, a warm glass of, a glass of water, or sometimes what they need is a timeout. An overseer protects the sheep. So if you're a leader, maybe you're a Sunday school teacher or you're a care group leader, then it's important that you make sure that you're watching what they are fed, that the teaching is good. It's not easy to be a leader of God's flock because everything we're called to do means we're going to have to sacrifice. Well, verses 2 and 3. Verse 3 says this, Not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. You know, Christ set the example. That's what says leaders are to do. Set the example. Be the kind of person that Christ has called you to be. Be the kind of person to say, look, again, the leader not in back, everyone pulling them, the leader in front saying, come on, here's where God's calling us to go. Now, this is a scary verse if you're honest with yourself. If you're a leader and you read this, there should be a little bit of fear in you because none of us are perfect. You know, if you're looking for the perfect pastor, and the perfect leaders, you're at the wrong church. You know where you should go? Nowhere. There is no right church. Jesus was the only perfect leader. And so if you're looking for a perfect pastor, you know, they can pretend to be, oh, I got everything together. But like you, we have areas where we struggle. And hopefully we're further along, but we're not perfect. And we have our issues. Our hearts are fickle at times like yours. I love God, but I don't love him as much as I should. None of us here are perfect. God is not calling for perfect pastors, leaders, Bible study teachers, or parents, but for real ones who will allow him to mold them, who will allow him to smooth off the rough edges, who are coming to him and just saying, Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to be an example. Well, at the end of verse 2, it says, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. That's one thing to say, willing to serve. Eager to serve? I mean, Come on, that's like a really high bar. All right, Jesus, I'll go do this for you. It's supposed to be, all right, Jesus, let me go do this for you. But that's what he's calling of us. As leaders that we would desire, would want to serve the people God has placed in our care. Leadership in God's economy is about other people. Eager to serve, why would we do that? Well, one of the reasons is because there are rewards promised in Scripture. We read, and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So Peter's saying, hey, it's going to be work, and you're going to have to sacrifice. But there's a reward waiting for you that doesn't end. And this crown of glory, it does not fade. Unlike the fading crown of glory, the, the withered parsley, that would be given in ancient Olympic events. So the Olympics in the ancient times, normally what they got was just simply this laurel wreath that they'd put around their head and, you know, eventually the leaves, you know, it dies and that's all you had. Even in our day and age, people spend their lives preparing for the Olympics. Oh, our son Joel was a swimmer and so many of the parents made, oh, my kid's going to the Olympics. And the elite level swimmers, like in high school, there was eight practices a week or seven practices a week, like eight actually, and they're supposed to go to seven of them, morning, night. They would literally practice Saturday for three hours, then go to a swim meet to swim. 
Like, it's all-consuming. These people, they give up everything. We were glad when Joel said, I don't want to swim anymore. It's like, yes, thank you. And honestly, we tell people all the time, if your kid's, oh, you're thinking about taking your kid that competitive, like, serious hardcore swimming, don't. Don't do it. If anyone had told us, we would have been like, no, Joel, I think baseball's a lot of fun. You really enjoy that, right? So these Olympic athletes, man, they have given up everything. Some of them have sacrificed their family. They don't even have jobs. They, I've, I've seen some, they work like Home Depot for four hours a day, and so they can still go work eight, out eight hours a day. They live in poverty to get that. And do you know how many of them get medals? Three. The reality is there are so many people who go to those Olympics, they walk away with nothing. Only one gets the gold, one gets the silver, one gets the bronze. You get bronze, that's impressive. Do you know how much metal, how much the metal is worth in a bronze medal? Google told me. $3.50 worth of metal. Now, I did see on eBay, I went to eBay to see, I wonder how much they could actually get. About $1,000 you can buy a bronze medal. So you gave your entire, and by the way, someone's selling it. So, you know, like, I need some cash, bronze medal. $1,000 is all that's worth. Peter's saying, man, look at the reward. This is a crown of glory that will never fade away. How much more worthy is this? How much more should we be willing to sacrifice? Well, what's the reward going to be? That's one of the difficulties we, we have. Like, what do you get in heaven? You know, on earth, you know, if you're, you, you do something amazing, maybe you work for a big company. Like, I've seen people get these unbelievable trips somewhere. Company does something, dumps money on them. The CEOs often get, you know, here, let's thank you, and here's $10 million more because the $30 million you were making wasn't enough. So what do we get in heaven? You know? Well, and over here, because of your hard work and your labors, we have for you this gorgeous mansion. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. That's just for all of you leaders who really serve. And over here is a divine Maserati. This car is fast. Your friends who didn't serve, they're in the Prius over there. <laughs> Lucky if they can hit 60. But not you. You served. Obviously, that's not how it is. And yet, the scripture is clear, there is rewards for those who serve, that you will get to heaven, and if you never gave and you never served, you're going to say, wow, I wasted so much, I lost so much. It's not you don't get to see Jesus, if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you enter heaven. But you won't have the rewards waiting for those who have given their lives serving. Well, we're going to conclude our passage today with verse 5, which says this, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. So he's been giving kind of for elders. Here's what you need to do. Here's all the, the, really the rule, all the stuff he's putting on you about the kind of person you need to be. But kind of for the rest of you, he's saying, submit yourself to your elders. He's continuing this thought, and he says the command is really for the entire congregation. What is the job? To be submissive. This is the Greek word hupotasso. It's often used in military type settings. It's the idea of a, someone coming under a leader. So a sergeant who tells the private underneath them what to do, and you don't say like, well, sir, I don't really feel like doing that. You say, yes, sir, thank you, sir. You don't argue with them. And that's what this is about. It's the job of the congregation to listen to the leaders. This is affirmed in Hebrews chapter 13, which says this, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So here it says they have to give account. In other words, God's going to say to us, what did we do to help you grow? What did we do to make this a place where Christ could be exalted? And so your job is to make it easy for us to lead and to serve. Now leaders, though, I do want to warn you, Jesus has some really strong words for you when he calls you to lead as the servants. He says this, Jesus called them, that would be the disciples, together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise, exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So leaders, Christ is calling you to serve in the same way that Jesus served. To give just as he gave. To wash the feet of the disciples, even though they didn't deserve it. He was their leader, their master, but he did it. 
Not because they have to, but because it's what God calls them to do. Churches need these kind of leaders or else we will be in trouble. I've watched a show for several years called Gold Rush. It's on television. It's one of these reality TV shows, except it's not like a bunch of women like arguing over something. It's these guys who are literal gold miners up in Alaska. They run gold mining operations. We're not talking like a pan, and that's what they do. They've got huge operations, millions of dollars a year. And one of them is run by this guy, Parker Schnell. And he first was introduced to the show when he was 15 years old. Another gold mining group that they had that they were following didn't know what they were doing. And they literally made, like, I forget, $30,000 for the year for, like, three or four guys. Like, they lost so much money. But they had no clue. And this 15-year-old who had been mining since he was a little kid would come over and give them tips. Oh, no, no, you should be doing this instead of that. So the next year, Parker's grandpa, he comes from money, and he comes from a family that's always done this kind of stuff. Grandpa says, I'm going to let you run my mine, and you're going to be in charge. Now, there's, like, two guys. It's a small operation. But Parker, as this 16-year-old, knows what he's doing but he is obnoxious as a boss. And so I remember there's a classic one that they've shown again, they recently showed, and it was him with this guy who was more than three times his age, an experienced miner who'd done something wrong. He'd made a mistake. And Parker goes and just starts chewing this guy out. And the guy's like, I don't have to take this from some snot-nosed kid. And at that point, Parker's grandpa drives up. And he, hear, he heard what was going on, he pulls Parker over and he says, Parker, you can't treat people this way or you won't have any employees. And what we've seen over the past eight years is Parker loses most of his employees, and no one wants to work for him. And I recently saw him really saying he's learned he's had to change some, how he's treating them. Now, he's still really a jerk. I would still never work for him, but he's not as bad as he was. <laughs> Friends, God's calling for humble leaders. Not ones who go like, I'm an authority. That's what Parker would say, like, hey, this is mine. That's my money. I'll do what I want. That's not how leaders are to be. We're to be humble, and we're to listen and to care. We're to be servant leaders. And I want to tell you this. When I look at the leaders in our church, I see men and women who truly love God and want to serve. And I'm calling you, follow their example. Whatever it is you're doing, follow that example. Because if you're part of this church, God is calling you also to humbly serve and to listen and to be there. So whether you're an elder, a deacon or deaconess, a committee chairperson, a Sunday school teacher, a care group leader, whatever God calls you to do, do it for his glory and do it humbly. Many of you knew Mike Conley. He was a member of our church for a decade. He moved away about 15 years ago. And uh, Mike was an intellectual. He was one of these guys who liked to read like theology. And I'm not talking even modern. Like, he loved like the 400-year-old the books. And he just enjoyed that. <clears throat> Let me be honest, I am not an intellectual. I don't like the opera. I really, uh, I'm not into any of these things, and I don't like to read deep theological works for fun. When that was seminary, it's painful, it hurts. I love Christian books, but I want more application, or I want more, you know, how can it change my life? I'm not into deep theology. And he just, he loved that, like philosophy, like Melissa Petrushky, she loves philosophy. I've got a nephew who studied philosophy at a Christian college. He loves to talk about philosophy. When he and I spoke recently, like, it hurt. Like, by the time you're done, it's like, he's just going around in circles. He's like, well, you know, he's kind of arguing with himself then about, you know, well, if God is like this, then this, but this, and I kind of get my input, it's painful. So Mike was this kind of guy. And, you know, I liked him, but it just didn't really click personality-wise. But the more I got to know him, the more I grew to love him. Because he was a humble servant. He was an elder in our church, one of our leaders, board meeting every month, plus other work. He taught a kid's Sunday school class every week. He led a care group in his home. And he had some other things, vacation, Bible school, other ways that he'd serve. And one Sunday he came up to me after service talking about serving the Lord. He said, Mark, I really want to serve more, but I'm out already so much, and I've got four kids at home, and I, I just feel like I can't be out anymore. I said, Mike, like, you're doing a lot. Like, I, I don't think you need to do anything else. And he came a few weeks later and said, you know what? I decided I'm going to serve in the nursery once a month. Because that's during church and my family won't notice I'm gone. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, he was just looking for more. That's the kind of heart God wants us to have. That we're servants. That we look for opportunities to serve. If you're part of the congregation, I want to challenge you. How does God want to use you? What are you doing for his kingdom? 
Listen to your leaders then. We need your support. We need your encouragement. We need your prayers. We are not perfect. And so we need you to be lifting us up and helping us because we can't do the work here. We're only a small part of it. We need your help. And then elders, leaders, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, Bible teacher, parents, I want to challenge you, shepherd the sheep that God has placed in your care. Watch over their lives. Watch over their doctrine. A shepherd makes sure that the food that the sheep eat is good. Make sure they're getting good, solid doctrine and truth. And from the time the shepherd has to take the crook, and Jesus certainly does that with me, kind of grabs me, yanks me back, there may be times you have to do that. But feed the church the word of God. Nourish them with pure spiritual fruit. And know that there is a wonderful reward waiting for all who serve God faithfully. Let's pray.